morning, good afternoon, good evening. Today is January 17th, 2021. Welcome to the Julie and Milo show. Every time when Milo and I are getting together, we always talk about on passive. We always talk about the community of people that we connecting with. And our show has been around for a little bit more than a month. And we have over 46 shows in our YouTube channel. So I invite you to subscribe and like our YouTube channel and also uh, to join our Facebook group uh, on Passive with the Heart. Um, today, we actually have a special show. We usually introduce our guests. We usually interview our guests, but today we're making it different. It's our shows. So today, I'm here with Milo and Milo is going to tell his story. So get yourself ready um, to hear a story of this man who actually blessed me with the opportunity to be part of On Passive. And that is something that we are connected and that's something that we are so blessed. So let's get our conversation started, Milo. How have you been? I know that you have told a few story. I heard a few of them um, in your early lives, you know, the stories that you've already told in um, on passive webinar. But I wanted to begin by you telling us about the stories in your early life. Well, thanks, Julie. Thanks for actually thanks for interviewing me today. It's kind of a cool thing to get to be on the Julie Milo show, you know, telling my story. But so I'm going to I'm going to try to get through this quick as I can, because I, I'm old and I have a lot to tell. <laughs> I was I'm born, not old. Yeah, and, and what a blessing you've been to, to my life, you know, when I blessed you with own passive. Now you're blessing me all the time uh, by having, you know, people come in and, and grow in your team. It's just a wonderful thing. So 19, it started all back in 1956. I was born in Jefferson, Texas, a little town in Northeast Texas. My dad owned the oil well drilling business as it was in 1957. I got very, very sick. Uh, they thought I was gonna die. At the time, it was uh, some kind of flu, they thought, or whatever. I think it was kind of like, you know, who we're having now with COVID, but I contacted this and, and it looked like I was not gonna make it. And my dad prayed, he said, he said, God, he said, if you'll save my son, he said, I'll preach the word for you. So that's how our life started. And so ever since I was very small, my dad's been a preacher. Uh, so my dad beca become a preacher and uh, uh, God told him, he said, God told him to sell everything he had and go preach up in the hills of Arkansas and not take no money from no one, just use his money. And so my dad did it. And he was a faith man. He was a healer, uh, a faith healer type of guy. He just believed whatever God said was going to happen, you know, and I've seen it work out for him over the years. It's just crazy the way that it worked. But here he is with uh, four of us kids were still at home, my sister, my three brothers, and uh, the two older uh, brother and sister were already out of the house. One, my sister had married and my brother was, uh, you know, he was old enough to be out of the house on his own. And so we traveled up in Arkansas. Dad didn't take any money from anyone and he just used his money. And I don't know how long he, he was up there, a couple years, two, couple years. And uh and he started running out of money. So he said he prayed and and uh, he said, God, he said, I did what you said. He said, now you got to bless me because I ain't got no money and I don't have a job. And so you have to provide something. And so he got a call from uh, the local hometown, Jefferson, Texas, to come be the pastor. So he went back and he was the pastor of the church. And so growing up in Jefferson, the whole family sang. We, they sang gospel music and stuff. Everyone except me, I couldn't sing. I couldn't carry a tune, even though, you know, I was little. But, I mean, my younger brother, he could sing. Kurt could sing. But I couldn't sing. So all of that happened in, in Jefferson. Wait, before Jefferson, tell me, I, I know you did something cheap, mischievous in Jefferson's day. I know you, you shoot a man with a BB gun. And then uh, something happened, and then you get bit by a rattlesnake. So uh, I'd like to hear that story. 
Uh, that's a couple of funny stories, yeah. Uh, so, so when I was young, I was probably only four, maybe five years old, and I went next door, and the kid next door, he was a little bit older than me, but uh, he had a BB gun. Well, the, the porch was up a little bit, so we crawled under the porch, and it had lattice around the porch, and, and uh, so we were sitting there, and an old guy was walking by, and uh, an elderly guy, and so I took the BB gun and just shot him in the butt, you know, <laughs> and and he jumped, you know, and I thought it was funny. Well, then I took off running, and he seen me, so he knew where I lived, but there was three of us boys, and uh, so it was funny. It was always the three of us, you know, there were, we were two years apart, a stair step, so I go running back, and I run in the back into my room, and uh, so he goes over, and I hear a knock on the door, and he says, uh, Mr. Davis, he says, your son shot me with a BB gun. And uh, so I was sitting back there hiding. Well, my older brother walked through about then, and, uh, and the old guy says, that one right there, that guy, that, that boy. And so my dad picked up Cork, and he was whipping him, you know, and, and Cork was getting this whipping that should have been mine, right? <laughs> but I was back there laughing. Well, I thought the old guy had left. And so I walked out there. And the old guy goes, oh, no, no, it was that one. And then I got a whipping of my life, you know. So I, I've been through some stuff, but funny stuff. You know, it was not I was mean. I was just mischievous as heck. But uh, uh, with that same little kid, I remember we were we were out one day and we were playing with matches or something. And I lit myself, he lit me on fire. Or I lit on fire. I don't know, but I had on like one of these little polo shirts and mom kept it for years, but the shirt burnt all the way up, like right to here. And I, I was, uh, mom said I was, I was like not, not a normal kid. I was, you know, I was just abnormal, but I was no more abnormal than normal. She would say, you know, but, uh, I remember, uh, walking in that morning and, uh, Dad had just got in from a big convention or something, and so they were still sleeping or whatever. And, and I walked in, I said, Mom, Mom, Dad, I'm on fire. And my dad jumps up and he grabs that shirt off of me and, and it wads it up, you know. And, and so I didn't get burned even here, which was amazing because uh, the firemen came and, and talked to Mom and Dad, you know, and they told him about it. And they said, well, if he would have run, it would have probably burnt him because the, the wind would have but I didn't. Anyway, so that was another thing I went through. And then then, then this is a, uh, another story is I was probably right at five years old. And I went to get the paper, newspaper, but I did it. I never wore shoes back then. I hardly ever go without shoes now. But back then I didn't wear shoes. And I run across the yard. I got the paper and I was headed back. And when I was headed back, man, something bit me, you know, in my just underneath my ankle. And man, it just was like, two things went in, boom. And so I run in the house and I was screaming, mama, mama, mama. And, uh, you know, she, she looked at me and, uh, she seen these two red streaks going up my leg, you know? And she said, dear Lord, you've been bitten. And my dad was gone. And remember he was kind of like a faith healer. And so, uh, he wasn't there, but there was a guy next door at the church that was staying in the parsonage. He was preaching a revival for us, and he was a faith healer. His name was Drew Joyner. And mom run me over there, and I'll never forget, they put me up on top of a counter, and the guy started praying for me. And when he did, I looked down, and, and the stuff was coming out of below my ankle, but it wasn't red. It was green. It was like the venom from the snake. And uh, so we didn't know what I had been bit by for sure, so mom called up the fire department because the fire department took care of all that, you know, and they come over and they said, well, well maybe it was a, a snake or something. So they said, where were you at? So I told them how I run and uh, they went back looking and well, they found a den of rattlesnakes. It was a whole bunch of rattlesnakes and I had stepped down into that den of rattlesnakes and got bit, you know, but hey, I'm here to tell about it, you know, so that's Absolutely. a great thing. Absolutely. I know in your bio, you said that you asked your mom if you were abnormal. <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, I didn't. I, no, I didn't ask because people would say, is he normal? And she would say, he's no more abnormal than normal. You know, she just said, that's him, man. He's all, you know, and I've always been, you know, just kind of off. 
I, I don't march to the beat of anyone else's drum. It's just, the, you know, my drum that, you know, <laughs> I march to. So sometimes people think that's abnormal, but, you know, it's just always been normal for me. Uh, but, yeah. So that was what that was about. But um, So you play piano when you were 16 to 18? I did. That was that was a little later on in life. So we moved up to Michigan. We we moved from uh, Jefferson, where my dad he had he had bought a store. So we had a little grocery store, gas station type thing. He had a hundred acre ant uh, ranch with cows and stuff on it. And then God told him he wanted him to move to Michigan. So here we go. You know, Very cool. It begins my life of, uh, you know, being moved around the country. So dad went to all the way to the UP, which is way up north by Canada almost, you know, from one end of the earth to the other. And uh, we go up there and, and we started all over. And dad took a church up there. No one there, Harley. And, you know, but he built it up and then he got some houses. He he bought a bunch of houses. He had some rental houses and stuff. And dad was always one that he just, he could make money, you know. Uh, but we moved to the upper Michigan. We lived there for, in Marquette for two years. And then we moved to Escanaba, which was just a little way south, you know, 70 miles or so south of there. And, uh, and at one time, I know dad was going back and forth uh, up there to, to Michigan. And I'll never forget uh, one Christmas, uh, it, I think it was, it wasn't Christmas Eve, but it was close. It, it was like the 22nd, 23rd of Christmas. And I really get kind of emotional on this story, but I got to tell it. Uh, there's a song out that called Don't Let the Chain of Love Stop With You. And it was written by Rory and Joey and Rory, if you happen to know them. But anyway, one of the greatest songs I think ever written. And uh, it tells about, you know, how uh, this guy was driving down the highway and he seen a lady. He stopped to fix her tire. And then he goes to give her her keys back for her trunk. And she says, how much do I owe? He said, nothing. He said, just don't let the chain of love stop with you. And she said, oh, no, no, I want to pay. He said, no. And uh, so he left. Well, she drives into town. She goes to a little restaurant and she sits down to eat. And there's this girl that's pregnant. It looks like she's been on her feet all the time, you know, and, and she has a meal and it comes to like $5 and 60 cents. She leaves a hundred dollar bill. And when the girl goes to get the change, she slips out and underneath the plate, it said, don't let the chain of love stop with you. That night she goes home, she gets in bed with her husband and uh, she says, everything's going to be all right, Joe. And it was the guy that had fixed the lady's tire. It was just like, oh, my God, how my incredible. Gosh. That's almost like on passive is, you know, you bless someone, they bless you back. Bless them, bless them back. We picked up a couple that night, uh, you know, that was stranded on the road. And it was a young couple. And he thought she put gas in the car. She thought he did. And neither one of them did. And they're... They're 35 miles from any place. They're out in the middle of the, you know, there's just a long stretch. So dad made room in the car. You know, we all had to scoot together and stuff to get them all in. We took them up to the gas station, which was like 35 miles away, turned around, come back, let them put their stuff in their car, kept the baby and the mom in, in our car, keeping warm till their car got warm. And then they took off. Now, this was an Air Force guy. He was he was from the Air Force up there, K.I. Sawyer Air Force Base. Forty years later, my dad and mom's up between Menominee and Escanaba. Their diesel gels up on them, and it's freezing cold. And they're like, I don't know, they must have been 60, 65 years old. They were probably my age. You know, I thought it was old back then, but it's not really that old now. But anyway, they were there. They got out of their car to walk in sub degree weather they start walking why they did that i have no idea but they did and they're a long ways from any place but they had a friend that lived a couple miles down the road that they were going to try to make it there they seen lights coming from the other way and it's the desolate road so it, it was amazing that a car was coming a car was coming from the other way seen them turned around pulled up and picked them up and it was an air force guy it wow. was Air Force soldier, and he took them to uh, Pasix, and, and, and he wasn't home, and mom said, no, just leave us here. He said, no, absolutely not. He says, where do you want to go? He drove them like 35 miles into 
uh, you know, Escanaba, and then turned around. Now that goes to show you that, you know, what they did way back then now happened to them. You know, it's an amazing story, you know, and, and when I tell that story, a lot of times I just cry because I think of, you know, they did it for a soldier and now a soldier coming from the other way stops and picks him up. It's amazing, you know, how things like that work. But don't ever let the chain of love stop with you, you know, so. Uh, Absolutely. I really love the inspiration stories that you told. And it looks like you have done so much. Uh, I was always very competitive. So in, in uh, me and my brother, two years older than me, he was very good at what we call the sword drill. That's mm -hmm. where, you know, on youth night, you'd hold your Bible up, they'd give you a scripture and you would have to pull pull the scripture out and you would stand up. Well, he wasn't normal either because he could he could be sitting down and just stand right up. It's like he just flew up and he would start reading the scripture and he got all of them. And I was pretty good at it, but I was never as good as he was. And I remember one night I was frustrated and <clears throat> And I've always uh, uh, think in my head now, I got to level the playing field some way, you know. And and so we had these old theater seats that, that they would flip up, you know, when you're sitting there. So I was sitting next to him and he jumped up and I just reached over and I just flipped that seat right up because he would never look when he sat down. He just kicked his feet out and dropped. So he kicked his feet out and he hit the oak floor and his head hit the back of the seat. And my dad... My dad was trying not to laugh so hard, but he looked out at me and he goes. <laughs> so that was my first time on the stage, you know, so I made the stage that time. But uh, it was it was fun. I tell that story. Uh, he's up there now. Uh, so he's probably looking down and saying, Moron, do you have to tell that story? Because I always tell that story on him, you know. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but I remember I told my dad, I used to tell my dad, I would, I would say, dad, I was probably 15, 16 at the time. I said, dad, you know what? I remember walking in one day and he was sitting down and I said, you know what? I said, you need to thank me. He says, thank you for what? And I said, you need to thank me for your prayer life. I said, cause it wouldn't be near as good if you didn't have me because I keep you on your knees praying. He said, man, he said, you, you can take that one to the bank. He says, you always did that. <laughs> and my dad always had these cool sayings. Like he would say, just do it, you know? And, and if I said, I can't do it, he'd say, can't, never could do nothing. He said, just do it. And he, that was for Nike had come out with just do it. You know, he was saying that and, and can't, never could do nothing. So I remember that, but, uh, I, they wanted me to play the piano and get into the part where you were telling, they wanted me to play the piano, but I didn't want to play the piano because I knew that they would keep me, uh, they would make me uh, practice all the time. You know, I didn't want to do it. And I remember, I said, no one plays the piano, you know, or whatever. And anyway, I seen a guy playing the piano that was my age and all the girls were gathered around him. And I said, right there, I said, ah, guess what? I'm going to play the piano. So from the time I was probably 16 till I was almost 18, I played the, I played the piano no less than 10 hours a day, you know, and I learned, I got, you know, decent at it. So I worked at Holiday Gas Station. I graduated in 1975. Wow. It looks like you've done so much. I know that you graduated in 1975. And then what happened after you graduated from high school? Well, I tell you, I couldn't get out of the house fast enough. I wanted to leave. You know, I wanted to be on my own. Even though I had a full ride scholarship to college, I didn't want, I didn't want that. I wanted to get out. I wanted to get married. I was ready to get married and start my family. So I got married in March 5th, 1976. Probably the best thing that ever happened to me. I mean, uh, I married Peggy, uh, who was, you know, just, uh, she was a, a lot of fun. She was the life of every party. Um, I worked at a, at a fence company when I, I remember I started, I think it was less than two bucks or something I started. And uh, then I, they asked me to be the alternate steward I was, which put me up to the second spot. I realized, man, I can be the second on the spot. So I got a little better uh, job. And then we, we moved to Southwest Michigan, which is down by Chicago. We moved down by uh, Dewajak. And uh, I had two beautiful daughters down there, Jessica and Marla. 
you know, and life was good. You know, I would go out fishing and stuff with them. And we grew up in the church, you know, so we grew up uh, singing Southern gospel mi music and stuff. We sang for many years, uh, 35 years with my late wife, Peggy. And later, you know, later in life, we added in the girls, you know, they, they would sing with us. And I remember at every holiday or whatever, we'd sing, stand around the piano, we would we would sing and stuff. And, yeah, you know, we'd teach them how to sing harmony and stuff. And uh, so it's always a lot of fun. I played a lot of softball, a lot of basketball uh, growing up. And and when in the early years, my da daughters wanted to be cheerleaders. So when they were a cheerleader, I would become a rocket football coach. And, you know, I like to I like to think that I had something to do with some of the young men, a uh, uh, seven year old Mark State. And I had him uh, as his first rocket football coach. Now, I don't take all the credit for it or anything because it's just that I maybe impacted his life because I was his first football coach, but his dad was also a great coach. And he went on to play in the NFL. Now he's actually the assistant coach at uh, Michigan State. Uh, Danny Tobin was another kid on that same team. He went on to play for the Cincinnati Reds. Eric Charles was on there. And uh, I think that class was the class they were the 1990 state champions of uh, – to Wajak, Michigan. I was very involved in church. I played the piano in church. I uh, helped them build the new rec center. Uh, you know, one of the funny stories that I that I like to tell on myself was uh, I used to wear a wig back in my softball days because my head would just cook. So I would wear a full wig, but I wasn't, it was, I was funny with it. I'd be sitting in church and like this one lady would always look up there at me and I would flip my wig up right while I'm playing the piano. I'd flip my wig up. And people would crack up laughing. So the whole church knew about it, that I wore a wig. Well, we had this young guy to come in, and he was like I call him the golden tongue. He was preaching for us. His name was Jeff Butler. And, and the guy was just a tremendous speaker. Well, everyone always, you know, I usually am the guy that people will pick out of the crowd to come up and help them. So uh, he did. He, he says, hey, Milo, why don't you come up and help me? And so I go up to help him. Actually, I think he said fish because that was my name on my uniform. And I go up there. Well, he didn't know I had a wig on. So he's preaching about Satan's like a roaring lion. And, and as Pentecostal preachers will do, he got, you know, to point one, point two, point three. And I would, when he would come, I would raise my hand up and go, rah, and he would back off. And then he'd build it up again. He'd come. Well, on the fifth one, he goes, he goes, I'm going to show you what to do to that devil when he comes at you like a roaring lion. And he comes towards me and I go, rah. And he says, you reach up and you grab his mane. And when he did, you know, he started, my hair started coming off and he's trying to push it back on. Well, I'm cracking up because I'm a big jokester, right? And I look out in the crowd. I'll never forget that day. Old Mel Everly was sitting on the aisle and he just went, boom, right out, fell right out in the aisle. And the minister, he comes off his chair, you know. And the whole church is cracking up, and this guy thinks that he embarrassed me, you know, but he didn't because everyone knew me, you know. And uh, so we laughed about that, and uh, and so I remember he said, uh, he sat down for a while, and he had then lost his thought and everything, and he says, I bet you wonder how I'm going to get out of this one. He says, sometimes the devil will deceive you, you know, so it was funny. Uh, it just cracked us up, but that was a good story. Uh, you know, uh, Jeff Butler's known all over the world for that, I say. I said, you know, do you tell? He said, no, I don't tell it. He says, I don't even want people knowing it was me, you know. And so we laugh about it and stuff. But uh, uh, <laughs> I, just some crazy stuff I did. I remember telling the minister once I walked out and uh, he had went a little bit too long on the sermon, you know. And, and I remember saying, hey, dude, I say, if you don't strike oil in 15 minutes, please quit boring, you know. <laughs> and he <laughs> laughed about it. But I had many jobs growing up. I mean, uh I, like I said, I never went to college or anything, but I want to tell you that I, I'm not against college at all. I think, you know, you should go if you want to go, but I don't want anybody to let that hold you back because it never did me. And you can go any place you want to, and you don't, you know, do your own thing and you can make things happen for you. You know, it's just a matter of wanting to do that. But I had many jobs. I was a mill room supervisor. You know, I had 210 people working for me at one time. Then I got into sales, lawn sprinkling uh, systems and stuff. Uh, 
And I don't have time to tell the two stories. They're great stories of, of what turned my life around as a salesperson. But if you ever want to know, just ask me. I'll tell you the two stories. Just tell me to tell you the Bob stories, and I'll tell you about it. I was in window sales. Then I got into lumber sales, and uh, it was crazy. You know, lumber sales was very, very good for me. I am very blessed. I got to tell you that I am the most blessed guy in the world. It seems like everything I've done in my life, has been, you know, it's turned out good. You know, not not everything, but I mean, it, it normally always works for good. I always look at it as it's a stepping stone to get to where I want to know. Like, uh, you know, if I hadn't had a couple failed uh, businesses before, you know, I wouldn't have known the people that got me into home passive, you know. Uh, so that's a, that's a cool thing. But uh, so I have three grandchildren. And I'll tell you, they're the apple of my eye. I have a grand uh, son named Cooper. He's 16 years old. I have a, a granddaughter named Reagan. She's 14. And Riley is nine. And honestly, they're like the apple of my eye, you know. Yeah. You know, listen, he, sitting here listening to your story, seeing that you live your life, you live every moment of your life. You enjoyed it so much. Uh, grew up as a very mischievous child. You've done so much. And it seems like you have it all together. You know, um, it, it seems like your life is going well from one place to the other. You move, you got married, you did so well. And it seems like you had the tire grab by the tail and then something happened. Do you want to tell us that story? It did. It did. I, I honestly, you know, thought everything was going perfect for me. You know, I had a grandson. We built a brand new, beautiful home, big home, and uh, things were going so well for me. And I had just changed jobs, and then it hit. But that story would take way too long to tell, Julie. Uh, those I call. No, my maybe just a little bit, just a little tiny bit, and then, uh, and then maybe. We can have another segment. We can tell that story a little big, deeper, a little, little bit deeper. So just, well, just a little bit. 2008, you know, I'll never forget when it came crashing down. When we went in, my wife, who had never hardly taken an aspirin in her life, you know, never been sick, perfect shape, walked all the time and everything, she got cancer. And that's about all I can say about it, you know. Uh, she got cancer, and I will tell you this, that cancer will take you down, and, and uh, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. It's out of your hands, and so if you have health, if you have health, you have everything right now. And so, uh, you know, uh, it is a, it's a very inspiring story about Peggy. She was the most inspiring person ever that I've ever met, and uh I owe a lot of how I live my life now to her, you know, what she's did. And, you know, there's a quote that says uh, that if it wasn't for the bad side effects of cancer or whatever, everybody should experience it, you know, and I wouldn't take nothing for those five years that I spent when they told her she would had 10 days to live, 10 days to 10 months to live. She lived for five years, but I it, it, will have to tell that another day. If people want to hear it, you know, they can put it in right. the comments. They can put it in the comments or whatever, and we'll have to do another show because I think I'm running out of time now. But uh... Wow. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I think we should have another show that talking about Peggy um, inspirational years. Okay. Um, um, now, let's move on to 2013 when you moved to Nashville, Tennessee. Um, tell us a little bit about it. All right, Julie. Yeah, I, I moved to Nashville after Peggy had passed away. I probably lived there for six months or so, and things just didn't seem right. So I, I moved to Nashville. Oh, my God. I have so much fun in Nashville. Nashville is the funnest place ever, uh, you know, in the in the world. So I would get up and sing karaoke and stuff like that. Uh, I love to sing. And so uh, I remember I was singing at karaoke one night, and um I asked the, the uh, guy behind the bar, I said, hey, is it possible that Vince Gill ever sings in Nashville? Because I had a chance to go see Vince Gill in 1990 or 80, late 80s, I guess. And I didn't go. I told Peggy, take her sister. So her and her sister went and they heard him. We loved him. And I've always loved Vince Gill, you know. And uh, so he said, yeah, they sing every Monday night. So that Monday night, I was there. 
And I, I didn't hardly miss one till you know, the tornado in uh, February of this year. And then of course we had COVID hit and all that. And, and Vince is now actually, he he's not with the time jumpers. He, he's with the Eagles, but I got to see him all them years every night. In fact, I actually got to sing with him. That's something that's kind of unique that uh, a lot of people would know. He called me up on stage to sing with him. So that's my story of the time jumpers. Uh, I love the time. Thank you. Jumpers. And then I know you go to the, the time jumpers every Monday night, almost every Monday night, like c committed. I am right? very, very, I'm probably very. the biggest time jumper fan there is, you know, I know all the guys and uh, it's just a cool place to hang out. Right. So, so in Nashville, Tennessee, I've noticed that you are doing Ubers and Lyft um, in Nashville. And I know there's a couple of times I called you and you're like, oh, I, I'm, I'm busy driving. I'm going to call you back. So I'm pretty sure you have a lot of stories to tell. So tell us a little bit about Uber and Lyft stories. Well, you know, <laughs> I do because I drive late nights. I, for a long time, I would drive uh, from three o'clock in the afternoon to about six in the morning. You know, the best time to drive because you're picking up people that have been out partying. So I found out where all the good party places are. I found all that. I heard some cool story and I met some amazing people. And one thing that I will tell you when I was out driving and stuff, we're all, all of us have our ups, all of us have our downs, you know, and if people would realize that, that, you know, we all go through that but we can all make it, you know, if we just live one day at a time and live in the moment, you know, uh, but there's, there's way too many stories of Uber and Lyft that I could, I could tell you about, uh, but we better not go into those. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, listen, 2017 is a, is a time that you and I kind of heard about each other. Uh, we were involved in a company uh, but we didn't really meet until uh, sometime in 2018. And that was some of the multi-level marketing that we got involved. And I know you got involved in many more prior to that. So you want to tell us a little bit about your time from uh, when you started multi-level marketing up until 2019 or late 2018? Absolutely. I mean, I've been in them all, Julie. I started when I was 16 years old. Of course, I, I can talk, as you can tell, you know, and I started out with Amway when I was 16 years old. Then I was in Melaleuca. I was in uh, Herbal Life. I've been in all of them, just anything you can think of. And they're good companies. A lot of them are great companies. But the thing I always had a problem with was I could always make money with them because I could get out, I could sell, I could recruit. But a lot of the people that I brought in was not able to do that, whether they didn't feel comfortable doing it or they couldn't do it or didn't want to do it, whatever, you know. And so I had come to the point in my life in 2018 after we had went in, in this uh, one that we was in, you know, and, and I just said, you know what, I'm tired of it. I'm not going to do it anymore because it's like I bring people in and you got to you know, people leave because of the monthly fee or whatever, I'm planning on doing anything at that Right, point. right, right. So 2018, you were still in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm here in Orange County, but then something happened, and then you and I actually physically met each other at the Dolby Theater in uh, 2018, and then early of 2019, we traveled to Vietnam with a whole bunch of people. And then sometime in 2019, you told me that you did something for me uh, about this company, this amazing company. And then I later on found out from you, you were like, Julie, this on passive is amazing. You're never gonna have to worry about money in your lifetime, in your kid's lifetime. And then I'm like, okay, tell me why on passive and why you literally blessed me by sharing me about on passive. Well, Julie, it's a it's a it's a good story, okay? When I heard about on passive, I said it's too good to be true, and I first turned it down. You know, but as I drove home, I realized, what if I just 
turn down the opportunity of a lifetime because I wasn't open-minded about it. And so I called her back up when I got home and I said, hey, I'm gonna go ahead and join. So I joined. And at that point, I, you know, I got my brother in, got my two daughters in, and then, uh, you know, I was struggling financially, as you remember. And, uh, and, uh, and I remember talking to you and you said, well, hey, I got a little extra money. You can borrow some of mine. I said, no, nah, no. Nah. And, and, but deep inside, I was saying, oh, well, it'd be nice, you know. And, and then you kept saying, well, you can borrow. And so I did. And remember, you blessed me with it. And then I, I got the money back. I paid you back with interest or whatever. But then I said, I said to myself, I'm going to put her in here. You know, so I did. And and I don't even remember if I told you right away or if it might have been a little bit, you know, but I, then I remember telling you this stuff because I would hear this stuff and I'm like, man, this is so cool. If this really happens, you know, or whatever. And And what I can say is two years later, it was one of the best decisions I ever did in my life because when I blessed you, you turn around now and you bless me like crazy because, you know, you're, you're part of my team and you're bringing in all these people, you know, and so it just works out beautiful. That's a, that's a beautiful thing about on passive. I love the part that when you give, it comes back to you. It's crazy. I think, I think you told me um, about it so much more uh, after you went and met with Ash Mufar, the CEO of the company in Orlando, and that gives you the, the validification that you said, I'm going to do this. And, and, and you are like determined to be in it to win it. And that's when you start telling me, hey, Julie, um, I just I got you a position. And then and then I hit some hard, tough time. And then I was telling you and you were like, Julie, I can lend you some money. And we kind of like, kind of like really blessing each other in a way. But then after you went back from Orlando, uh, you was like every single day um, telling me that, you know, I'm not going to be worried about money at that time because you watched me having such a hard time working so hard with the previous company and like, you know, putting so much sacrifice in it. And then you like, Julie, went on passive launch, you never gonna have to worry about money anymore, not in your lifetime, not in your kid's lifetime. And then when I finished that, I start focusing on on passive. It was such a great um, uh, way to literally saying to myself, now I can breathe, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, and, and you know, it is true that when I met Ash Mafaro, I'm going to tell you that guy had the biggest smile. He has the biggest heart I've ever seen. His passion is incredible. His energy is just off the charts. And when you meet this guy, I see him coming from 40 feet away, big smile on. He embraced, uh, said, my brother, you know, and and then he sat down and he talked to me and he blew me away with everything he said. And I realized at that point, at that point, man, you know what? This is real. This is real. And now, you know, I have this saying that uh, on passive is changing the world one person at a time. And it started with Ash Mafaro, you know, but it's continued around to us. And, and you know, originally when we would get into the company, people would get into the company it was all about, well, wonder how much money can we make? Now, I don't think the founders, most of the founders we talk to and the founders that have been in a while, they don't even worry about that because they know that's a done deal. The, the numbers are already there. You know, Mike Williams does such a great job projecting it out. And, you know, with his projection, if it, you know, that's only if it works the way it was back three, four months ago. Well, we know that this thing is gaining speed. It's like a locomotion that's hit the top of the hill and we're starting down, we're picking up and we're going to pick up a whole lot more, you know? And so it's a done deal as far as the money, but now we all have this passion in our heart about changing humanity. How can we help other people to enjoy this freedom, enjoy this time freedom? That's what it's all about. You know, 
who cares if you got so much money in the bank that, uh, you know, you don't even know what to do with it and you can't spend it, you know, who, who needs that, right? But as long as you, yeah, every day you go to your wallet and it's there, man, and you, you can just live your life, but you can bless other people. It's crazy. We got the thing that, you know, I say a lot of times about the orange. How many oranges can an orange create? Well, it's in, infinite because the, each orange got seeds in it and each seed creates a, a tree. And, you know, each tree creates multiple oranges. And that's the way it is with on passive, you know. So it is a is an incredible opportunity. But you know, we all we can do is present that opportunity to someone. If they if they like it, they accept it. If they don't, that's not on us. That's on them. We know that sooner or later they're probably going to come back because you got all your social medias. I mean, on passive is a full thing of everything. Of course, I don't have to go through all that. Most people know, but the, uh, it is a great it is a great company. I can't tell you how thrilled I am and thankful for Mr. Ash Mafaro, what he's done for us. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why I resonate so much with your message, with the passion and also the vision of Mr. Ash Mufaro. Um, that's one of the reasons why we are so connected um, and we cannot stop talking about on passive. That's one of the reasons I think for you and I to start the Julie and Milo show um, and then connecting with other leaders, other founders with an on passive. I mean, we our our goal at that time was just to start how can on passive help other businesses. And then we we ended up like at that time we were thinking, oh, we're gonna do so that we can build our network, build our team. But then we ended up changing the it to a little better where we connecting with other founders. I know both of you and I are really busy with the Julie and Milo show. Uh, interviewing people, editing, um, and then uploading. And, uh, and, and, and I know a lot of people um, are actually using the shows uh, to be able to share that with people to be able to be, be able to build that network. Um, and then for us, hopefully we continue to build our team as well. So I share this message with you, um, go back to the person and get signed on to become a non-passive founder. Uh, but because you are in it, you see how excited Milo is. So Milo, any last words about um, um, your word of wisdom? I always ask the founders, any last words on, on, on the wisdom that you could share with the people that still on the fence um, or the founders that actually became a founder and haven't done anything, any uh, word of wisdom? Well, I just say engage, you know, even these videos where you watch founders, they're incredible. You watch incredible founders tell their stories. It's going to get you excited about it. You know, use the videos. We do it for everyone else. We don't do it for us. We do it for the own passive family, mainly that everybody can use it. Put your links on it, whatever, you know, that you want to do, sending them out. You know, it's all about helping other people. But if you're on the fence, or you haven't engaged, or you, you haven't actually joined yet, there's not a better time than yesterday, but I guess today will work too, you know, but, <laughs> you know, yesterday would have been better, but today, today will work, you know, but you want to get in as soon as you can, because it's, it's all time stamped. It's, it's a beautiful thing, uh, you know, and you don't have to understand it all. That's the cool thing. Don't, don't worry about understanding it all, because I guarantee if you want to understand it all, you're going to be after the launch because it takes you a while to uh, to understand all this stuff. I've been at it two years and I still find new stuff every day, you know, so yeah. get in while you can. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Milo. Thank you for sharing your story. I know I was in on the treat and so I got myself a champagne glass and and then uh, this is just bubbly water. <laughs> I knew I was in on a treat, so I brought myself a drink here today. Um, but I, I really have a good time uh, listening to your story. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, and I know if you listen to this story, uh, this is a man who blessed me with the opportunity of on passive. So get back to the person um, who shared this message, the on passive message with you. Any last words, Milo? get in when you can and thank you for allowing me to share my story you know uh i got so many stories to tell it's crazy but thank you for allowing me to share my story and hopefully you know people enjoy it
Absolutely. Thank you so much for watching. Cheer to you. Blessings to you. <laughs> and looking forward uh, to hear from you. And if you have a story to tell, um, the Julie and Milo show is a place to tell. It's a safe place. It's comfortable. Um, we, Milo and I just have a conversations and we just happen to make that show for you. Um, and it's the same thing with other founders. So let us know if you have a story to tell and, um, Hopefully you subscribe to us so that there's um, any videos coming out, you'll have it. Um, thank you for watching. Looking forward to see you on the next show. Good night. Good night from Nashville.